without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Brennan, and he will tell you about predicting snowmageddon. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction, uh, Greg. I'm uh, excited and nervous uh, all at the same time to give this talk um, about Snowmageddon, which I'll define what that means uh, in just a minute. And we've already got an intro. I will note that this was a commemoration of my last good haircut. Literally, that was the last good haircut I have, and then it's, it went downhill very quickly. Um, but uh, embracing this, uh, this new hairstyle. The one thing that's not in the intro that I wanted to talk about is how did I get involved with snow loads? I was a grad student and I was faced with two options. One was to take a summer research experience working on snow loads, which means the weight of snow, like how much snow weighs, or it was clean cabins at Bear Lake. And I was intrigued at the thought of cleaning cabins at Bear Lake. This summer research opportunity seemed more relevant and literally one thing's led to another where that little research project has uh, led to uh, changes in how the entire country uh, designs buildings for snow. Um, and uh, all because I just didn't want to uh, clean cabins at Bear Lake. So, um, so what is Snowmageddon? Well, it was a term that was uh, coined uh, with a 2010 snowstorm in the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. They got about 54.9 inches, so somewhere right here which if you're in the mountains isn't a big deal, but if you're in Washington, D.C., that's a big deal. They're not used to that. And uh, it shut down uh, transportation for about a week and uh, caused some severe life disruptions. And what, so I'm not interested in just Snowmageddon, but I am interested in this idea of how likely are these kind of events to happen? Because they don't happen very often, but when they do happen, uh, they can cause severe disruptions, and so can we predict how often they might happen? We don't know if it'll be next year or 10 years or, or 50 years down the road, but if we think about it in the long run, are we going to have 10 of these kind of events, or are we going to have one of these kind of events in the next uh, 100 years or so? And so that's uh, my interest here. We'll talk about how that relates to um, uh, infrastructure design in just a minute, but I want to kind of begin with the end in mind, the three big takeaways from this talk. And the first is, is that probability guides choices when we have uncertain information. And if you really start thinking about it, there's a lot of instances in your life where you don't exactly know what's going to happen. You just have a good idea of what might happen and you're making decisions based on what might happen. And that's probability. And it's a key part of decision making. And so what data scientists do with probability is they figure out how to tell the stories of recorded information, really big stories. So we've got these observations that people have been taking all over the country of snow. You can pick other things that people measure, um, millions if not billions and trillions of observations. And someone's got to figure out how to make sense out of all of that so that we can actually do something productive with that information. And that's what a data scientist does is it tells stories, hopefully true stories. Um, oh, and the last one was, is that going back to the first thing is that we have to make decisions today about how our society will look like tomorrow. And going back to the probability thing, we don't know what society will look like tomorrow. We can only estimate the probability of certain events happening, but we have to do it. We can't wait till tomorrow to make decisions for tomorrow because we're building buildings today that will last 50 or 100 years. Think about the people that built Old Main I don't know if they thought it was going to last this long, but it sure lasted a lot longer than the decade or 30, 40 years that uh, the original occupants uh, inhabited that building. So we have to think about how to build buildings that are going to last for a long time. And so to get started with probability guiding choices, I'm going to need a few volunteers. There is candy involved, although I think you need to wait to eat it till you leave. But I need a few volunteers, preferably um, like from grade like 3 to 10. Um, if we could get a few volunteers, I need about three, okay? So let's have you come down. Um, right there in the back black sweater, uh, if you can come down. And uh, right here in the red jacket, do you want to... Oh, if, how about both of you come down? We'll do four. So red maroon jacket, uh, yep, you. And then uh, deep red jacket, do you want to come down as well? We'll do four. <clears throat> we got the mic that I can use.
All right, is this working? Okay, great. All right, so here's the dealio. We've got these dice here, right? We're gonna roll over on this table. And uh, what I need you all to do, and I'm gonna ask you your decision and I'm gonna have you defend it. Okay, so you can play one of two games and if you win the game, you get chocolate and if you don't win, well, you don't get chocolate. <laughs> so game one is you take this dice, it's a regular six-sided dice, you can pick red or, you're just gonna roll one dice. And in game one, you get chocolate if you roll the number six. Okay, in game two, it's the same idea. You roll the dice one time and you win the chocolate if you roll a one, three, or a five. So we've got two games. You can play one or the other. You only get to play one game one time. So what game are you playing? I would play game two because okay. it's, it's like well, let's not, let's not, I'm going to come back to it. I want to hear everybody else, okay? Because you probably have a good reason for picking two. So what else? I'd pick game number two. Okay, two? Game two. Game two. Okay, is this just a peer pressure thing? No. Okay, so why are we picking game two? Because it it's has a higher like chance of a success because it's more than one number. Okay, you guys are all kind of nodding your heads. Okay, but you haven't rolled the dice yet, so you don't know what's going to happen, but you're really confident in picking number two. How can you be so sure when you don't know what's going to happen? The odds are in our favor. It's three out of Six. It sounds like a Hunger Games thing, right? May the odds be ever in your favor. All right, let's play. So you're all playing game number two, one at a time. I'll call out the dice roll. So if you want to roll it. Three. All right, you can grab. There's a chocolate in the bag there. Stay up here for just a minute, uh, but go ahead and grab the chocolate. Next one. Sorry, man. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I should, that was just me. Sorry about that. So uh, um, let's try again. Oh, another two. I think this dice is rigged. You better take that one. Yeah, roll again. Five. There you go. You get a chocolate. And a three. I think you better take another stab at this game. There we go. One. So everyone won. It took two tries for one, but you all made a good decision, right? You all picked game number two, but you could have rolled a six. What would have happened... And you roll the six, even though you're playing game number two. I mean, you wouldn't have won chocolate, but you were still confident, right? So the key here, thank you very much. Everyone give them a hand. <clears throat> the key to this game was it was unanimous and confident amongst everybody that they're going to play game number two, even though they hadn't played the game yet. And so we all have this basic sense of probability, which is that a game that has three chances to win, or a 50% chance of winning, is more advantageous than playing a game that has a one in six chance of winning. It's possible that you play game number two and you lose, roll on a six. But in the long run, you're better off playing game number two. And so that's a way that probability guides decision making. When we have a good sense of the odds, we can make decisions to maximize our odds of good stuff and minimize our odds of bad stuff. And so that's exactly what we want to do with the snow problem, which is there are a lot of places in the country where snow can pile up on roofs. This is kind of an extreme example. And given the language of that sign, I don't think this is actually the US, right? But that snow is producing a tremendous amount of weight, much more weight than if we just got a bunch of people on that roof. And if we get too much weight on a roof, then it leads to something like this. Although I don't know that this was a snow problem. This just seems like a kind of a badly built barn. But with enough snow, a roof's going to collapse. And this is serious business. Uh, Northern Idaho, 2017, woman goes out onto her porch. Porch collapses. It has like a roof porch under the weight of the snow. She gets trapped and it kills her. And there's been multiple documented fatalities due to snow causing roofs to collapse. I think it was just last year, a bunch of buildings in Chicago uh, collapse under the weight of snow. So too much weight causes collapse. We want to design our buildings to be strong enough to withstand that. But we've got to play an interesting balancing game, which is we can make super strong buildings. We did it in World War II, but that doesn't mean that they're very fun to live in. And they're also really expensive to make really, really strong buildings. And so we need to find a balance between buildings that are safe, but are still cost effective. And so all of this comes back to 
a decision about probabilities. How likely are we to see super extreme snow weight on a roof? And how do we design to minimize the probability of failure? We cannot guarantee a building will be safe. But we can, with reasonable, reasonably low probability, guarantee that almost all buildings will be safe almost all of the time. And so the way that we do this is that we try to identify a pattern in the information of the past to project what might happen in the future. And we'll talk about some of the issues with that when it comes to climate change. So what we have here are historical records from Tony Grove, as well as uh, records that have been taken at Utah State University of the weight of, of snow. I actually think the Utah State measurements were just snow depth, and my research team estimated the snow weight based on uh, climate factors, because we're interested in the weight, not just the height of the snow, because some snow is really fluffy and doesn't weigh very much, and other snow is like really, really dense. And so this goes to point number two of the talk, which is every measurement tells a story. And so this is a picture of Dr. James Edward Church and his wife, Florence Humphrey Church. And in 1906, Dr. Church, who was often accompanied by his wife, would go into the mountains uh, in the Sierra Nevadas, uh, so just outside of Reno, Nevada. And every month, he would hike in the snow, often with his wife, and they would take measurements of the snow. And they were interested in the water content which is very similar to snow weight. And so here they are taking like core samples. I actually think that they used to make fires and they would melt the snow to see how much water was contained in it. And what's really interesting to me is that, um, oh, and I also want to thank uh, Ann Hugley, who's at the Desert Research Institute, who gave me these pictures uh, for this, uh, these slides. What's interesting to me is that uh, that's a lot of work for a single data point. And Sometimes, as a data scientist, I'm working with millions and millions of data points, and it's easy to forget that every single observation tells a story. And my hope as a data scientist is to make sure that I do each individual story justice when I summarize the millions and millions of stories. So those manual measurements that began in 1906, well, they began before that in other places, but in the US, started in 1906, they continue today. So this is um, a... Uh, a snow training school where they teach people how to go and run what they call a snow course, which is you hike up in the snow, uh, like high into the mountains, and you walk along a path and you take snow cores, which is what they're working on uh, right uh, in this figure. There are people that do this in their own backyards on a regular basis. And you could actually volunteer to be one of those people. I haven't volunteered to be one of those people, but I benefit greatly from the people that do volunteer. Going in their backyards and taking little cores of snow or in the park next to their house, and then they report it into a central location that allows people like me, and I have used this volunteer data to help make decisions about how we design infrastructure. So if you want to change the world, you can do it one snow measurement at a time. Just go to the Coco Raz website. In addition to manual measurements now, we're getting into um, a, a series of automated measurements, which is making data a lot easier to collect. It also increases the amount of data that we have to use. And so these are what we call snowtail stations. This is, uh, I'm pointing like, you can see, I've got a pointer. I've got to get used to this. This is actually a snowtail station that's up by the Tony Grove Ranger Station up Logan Canyon. And this one, I have no idea where it is, but it had a uh, little... Uh, labels that were nice. So the way a snow tail station works is, is that they have a snow pillow that's here, and then they have a sensor that uses like uh, light or like ultrasonic frequencies to determine how uh, the depth of the snow. And this pillow here, as the snow settles on the pillow, it uh, compresses it, and they're able to measure the weight of the snow automatically using the antenna here that reports those observations to a computer so that no one has to go out and, and do it by hand. So these are really nice when we have them, but we don't have them everywhere. Uh, in some places, people actually now use satellites and they use uh, gamma radiation and, and water uh, reflects radiation. This is beyond my, uh, what I know, but like they use radiation to estimate how deep the snow is. So there's all kinds of ways that we're able to get these stories about snow into a database that we can use. And so now I need three volunteers 
uh, that weren't the volunteers I had before. So we got red right here in the middle on the back row. Yep, black Nike hat. And then right here in the, the jacket. Um, if you can come up, and I'm going to have you just write on the board. You got three markers. How you would measure this snow. And I've intentionally made it kind of ambiguous, right? Like the snow is not all the same height. I haven't labeled it very well. So I need you to use your best judgment to determine what is the height of the snow when all you know is that you're starting at zero and the max is 10 and it's somewhere in between. So if each of you could grab a marker and just write in big numbers between one and 10, feel free to use decimal points, what you think that measurement is. And then I'll ask you why you chose the, the measurement that you did. So take a minute. Number one to 10? Yes, well you can use decimals if you want like 1.7 or 2.5, but uh, you know, I just need you to tell me, what's the height of that snow? Where did the mic, where did I put that? Oh man, here, try this one. I should have planned ahead. Well, we've got one that works. Can you share your, uh, your marker? So we got a six. We've got one marker that works. Okay, a six, a 7.3, 7 7.8. Okay, thanks. Now I want to hear why. Why did you pick, why did you pick six? It kind of averages around the six. Okay, so you were trying to think, well, there's some spots that are low and some parts that are high, and I think that it's kind of in the middle going to be six. Great, thanks for that. Feel free to grab a, a little candy of choice and then you can go back to your seat. So uh, 7.3, what were you thinking with 7.3? I chose 7.3 because I was going sort of for average with the highest point. Okay, so it was kind of in the middle, but kind of erring on the side of, of, of higher is, is maybe a little better. Great, thanks for that. Why don't you grab a, a candy bar? And then 7.8, you're the highest of the bunch. What were you, what were you going with that? Well, I just was just like, I saw like where the half was, and then I was like, I think it's 7.8. Great, I like it. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. <clears throat> so measuring seems like it's a straightforward thing, but it's actually really hard. Do I measure in the middle? Do I measure the tallest? Do I measure the smallest? And the answer that I usually give my students is, well, it depends, right? If I'm interested in the most extreme outcome, I might measure the tallest point, which in this case happens to be an eight. And if I'm interested in the lowest point, that happens to be a four, at least for the, the dots that I've uh, used to kind of connect the lines here. <clears throat> and the middle value is precisely uh, six, so 1,000 points to Gryffindor. Um, <clears throat> forgetting the median, that's what we call the median or the middle value. Um, it's not always, we don't always have the right way to measure something, and so we often use things that kind of get at what we want, but not exactly. And so sometimes those measurements take the form, and this is actually, and I took the identifying information off because this came from the military, but these are uh, snow measurements in Minnesota that are handwritten. And the problem that I have is, is that they say what the snow water equivalent is, how much water's in the snow, it's how we get weight. I think it's a four, but it could be a nine, right? Yeah, so 2.4, that's probably what it is. But I looked at that and I was like, maybe it's 2.9. This one's pretty good. Sometimes it gets pretty bad. And I eliminated a slide where we get all kinds of crazy things in the data that aren't supposed to be there. And when we take handwritten measurements and we do conversions or the computer goes whack, we get measurements that aren't quite right. So part of the story of data science is cleaning through that noise and trying to tell the true story in the presence of incorrect information. And so we go from hand measurements at thousands of locations across the country. So the uh, uh, American Society of Civil Engineers snow load requirements that defines building codes uses these locations. Uh, there's, I think there's actually only 8,000. We started with 12,000, but not all of them qualified. And so we've got stories with missing observations and messy data at thousands of locations across the country. We have to figure out how to tell one common story for all those places. And so what we do is we extract them 
extract the information which has been stored in the central place. Some, we talk about data in the cloud. So this is data stored on a computer far away from where I live that I access through the internet. And the total size of the climate data that we looked at, which is a subset of the data we could have looked at, is about 30 gigabytes. Um, which, to put that in perspective, if you take all of Wikipedia and you store just the text, so you cut out the pictures, that's like 24 gigabytes. So this is bigger than Wikipedia, and we have to figure out how to handle it, and this wouldn't even be considered big data. There's problems that take um, terabytes or even petabytes, which are thousands of terabytes, and terabytes are thousands of gigabytes. So it's a moderate data problem with stations that all have information of varying quality. And we distill it down to a picture that looks like this. So this is the maximum snow weight measured in Logan, Utah. It's somewhere uh, just outside of town, probably over by the airport. In about, and we have about, uh, I think it's like, uh, I can't remember how many years of data, but it's somewhere on the order of like 50 so years of data. And then we have Tony Grove, which has about 30 years of data. And what these bins show, these little rectangles, is, whoop, going back. The height of the rectangle says the number of observations that had values around, in this case, 0.25. So 15 years, the maximum snow weight was about 0.25 kilopascals. But we had two years where the maximum snow weight was more than one kilopascal. And so what we are in, and then if you look at Tony Grove, you can see that the numbers are a lot bigger, right? So they're like four to 16 kilopascals because the mountains get a lot more snow than uh, Logan does. But the thing that we're really interested in is the shape of these. So we notice that at Logan, we have this huge spike right here at the 0.25. And then we have a few observations that are way bigger than the spike. And so we talk about this, this distribution of data, which is kind of the shape of these bins, having a long tail. That's what we call this kind of area over here, the tail. In Tony Grove, we don't have that tail. It's kind of just like, um, it doesn't have near as long of a tail. It's more just all kind of smushed in the middle. And so we take those bins and we put smooth, these are called probability distributions on top of those bins. And those distributions have different shapes. So the orange one has a long tail and the purple one doesn't. And what's interesting is, is when I stack them on top of each other, in this case, the uh, middle value, so the value that we're just as likely to be above or below is the same for both curves. But I'm interested in extreme snow. So that's the things that don't happen very often. So that's what happens when we move into the upper tail of the distribution. And so here, this would be the value for an event that we expect to happen one every 50 years on average. And we could have two 50 year events one year after the other, because things that are random don't behave exactly the way that we expect. But on average, over hundreds or even thousands of years, if the climate didn't change, we would expect to see values of about 15 once every 15 year, once every 50 years for the orange curve, and values of about 12 once every 50 years for the purple curve. And as we keep going to the further and further extreme events, so 100 year events where I stop, we could go to a thousand year event, pushing into the tail, we see that the orange curve gets bigger faster than the purple curve. So the key takeaway is, is that places in the United States that have orange curves, or they look like orange curves in their distribution shape, require us to build stronger buildings than places where we have distributions that look like the purple curve. And so this is a map of the snow load requirements that are used uh, in the International Building Code as defined for the US. And we can see that, as we expect, we don't have to think about snow very much when we're in Florida and Texas. We have to think about snow a lot when we're in the mountains uh, of Utah or the mountains of California. But we also have to think about snow quite a bit when we're in the Northeast or sometimes even uh, in places around the mountains, uh, kind of like where Logan is, which is right next to that black area. And all of these maps came from thousands of curves like this 
where we use those to balance the potential for failure along with the price of construction. Now, to end my talk in the last uh, five minutes here, what if the future doesn't look like the past? What if the future is changing? So everything I told you relied on this assumption that the next 50 years is going to look like the past 50 years. And we have a lot of evidence that that's not true. Um, here we've got snow tail stations in the mountains of the western United States. And red means that over the last 50 or so years that the average snowpack at the end of the year has been declining. And blue means that it's increasing. And so there are places where the snow is actually getting, the snowpack is getting bigger over time, but in most places the snowpack is getting smaller over time. So you think about those distributions or those histograms, it's what we call them, those like little rectangles for Tony Grove and Logan. Well, they're shifting and morphing and stretching and compressing in a changing climate, and we have to figure out how we're going to handle that. Over here on the right, this is a figure of what they call the Arctic amplification, which as global temperatures are rising, there is a trough of cold air that often comes down from the North Pole. Um, and that trough is shifting its location over time so that, paradoxically maybe, in the Northeast we're actually seeing longer, colder stretches in the winter. So we're not talking about generally colder everywhere, but that for certain periods of the winter we're colder for longer, and that's causing uh, some of these extreme snowstorms, which are actually increasing in frequency over time. The Northeast is getting more extreme snow rather than less even as we have, you know, uh, rising global temperatures. So how do we handle this? Well, this is kind of like the frontier of research for me, because I don't quite know the answer, and that's why it's kind of exciting. What I do know is, is that there are really, really smart physicists and computer scientists that have created meshes of the entire Earth. And so what they've done is they've taken the Earth and they divided it into a bunch of little grid cells, and then they've divided the atmosphere into a bunch of little grid cells. So we have this kind of like mesh of grids. And what they do is they use physics, the physics of weather. Heat and radiation cause water evaporation, which then causes uh, rain somewhere else, or possibly snow. And they take all of the physics, as far as we understand it, and they simulate what weather is going to look like in the future. And so what we do with those simulations is, is we make sure the simulations can match the past. It doesn't mean that we got today's weather right exactly. It means that we got the distribution, those curves that I talked about, that we're able to recreate those curves using, uh, using physics. And then we take that recreation and we run it forward into the future, uh, given the expected uh, global atmospheric conditions. And our goal, and what I've been proposing to do, is to figure out what the recipe for extreme snow looks like and how that recipe is going to change, how those probability distributions will shift as we move into a future climate. So I don't know the answer to how things are going to change in a future climate. But I do know that with data, we can come up with the best guess we possibly can so that the buildings we build today will be safe tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. And there's some times where we're going to get it wrong, and we have to live with that, because if we're using data properly, most of the time we're going to get it right. And so as a reminder, probability guides our decisions when we don't know everything. Data scientists try to tell the story of recorded information, often using probabilities. And because we have to make decisions today about the society we live in tomorrow, we have to be okay with a little bit of uncertainty. And I think that applies to all of us. All of us have decisions we have to make where we wish we knew inf more, more information than we do right now. And so what we do is we take the information we can see and we make the best decision we possibly can. And if you're doing that, you're ready to be a data scientist. Thanks for your time and attention uh, today. These were some people that have funded my work and some of the people that have helped me along the way uh, with researching, including a lot of students at USU and uh, thanks again, and I'm happy to answer questions.
So the question was, do I use neural networks or deep learning in this problem? And in this particular problem, uh, for the, the uh, engineers, we didn't. And part of the reason why is that we're still trying to get people to build trust in neural networks making decisions of that level of consequence. And, uh, and so the engineers that we worked with, and it was definitely a negotiation, really wanted things that were transparent and that we could like explain fully how they were making the decision. Not that it's a better decision. So we stuck with simple things so that we could explain it and get it to be adopted. And so it's kind of a step in the right, uh, getting them to step in the direction of data science without necessarily making them dive you know, headlong. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Bean. I'm curious who owns and manages the snow tile stations and do they have to be calibrated on a regular basis? So I don't know much about the calibration. I know that the information is uh, managed by the Natural Resource Conservation Service. So taxpayer money is, is managing all of these stations uh, for us at the federal level. And then it's all those uh, measurements are, are managed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and they, they're the one that create the central database that, that any of you can access. Um, and if you're interested, we've written some functions in the R programming language to make it easier. Ready? Thank you. Um, so in your studies, uh, very nice presentation. In your studies, do you uh, distinguish between, in extreme events, uh, between high snowfall rates over a relatively short duration as opposed to lower rates over longer durations and the different effects they may have on the infrastructure? Yeah, so that's a, I'm really glad you asked that. In this particular, uh, in the past, we just kind of treated the max snow load as a max snow load, and we didn't really care how we got there, whether it took two days or, or four months. Part of my work now uh, with one of my graduate students is, is differentiating between how we get to extreme events. So combining intensity and duration, because uh, that does affect uh, how snows retain roof. But uh, that's keeps, let's see if I can put it back here. Um, so it's an ongoing work. It needs to be addressed uh, for this initial run. We, we just thought about all snow as its peak and we didn't care how we got there. Other questions? We got one right here, Padres. Um, oh, here we go. Let me just, ready for long toss? Hey, thanks for your presentation. Um, what's like the standard then, like in terms of like a 50 year event or a hundred year event that buildings like should or, or yeah. are like built towards? So uh, it depends on the hazard with snow for a long time. What they would do is they would take a 50 year event and they would multiply it by a safety factor. So they'd multiply it by 1.6 and uh, that 1.6 had to do with what they call a reliability analysis. So they were trying to like target a probability of failure for a given structure. Now the new method, which I did not go into, we actually aren't simulating just the snow, but we're simulating a structure's response to snow. And we're, we're targeting a uh, probability of failure for a little building we designed. It's like a building with a beam, a uh, 30 foot beam, steel beam, and. And so we kind of pit the snow against the building and then we figure out how strong that beam needs to be to like make sure it lasts to a given probability. The Monte Carlo simulation, that's getting a little technical there, but uh, um, it used to be a 50 year event with a safety factor. Okay, I wanna thank Brennan and thanks for turning out for Science Unwrapped. Yeah, thank you very much.